Hello. Welcome to Legend of Our Time on GBC News. On this platform, we celebrate our achievers. My name is Gifty AJ. Uh, today, I'm privileged so much to host one of Ghana's astute diplomats who became secretary to former president, Mr. John Ejikun Kufo, and is currently the chair of the Council on Foreign Relations Ghana and Ivory Tower of Past Ambassadors. Ambassador Daniel Kufuo Ose, affectionately called DK Ose, is my guest for this edition of Legends of Our Time. Excellency, thank you for the honor. It's my honor and privilege to be hosted by GBC on you. Excellency, you're always smiling. Is it a, a diplomatic strategy or is something that you do unconsciously? I think I've always been a very happy person. <laughs> so the smile has always been with me. Uh, and in life, really, a smile uh, has therapeutic effect on everyone. So when you smile, you make people happy, you make yourself happy. Uh, That's why I'm, I'm always smiling. <laughs> and you know, it makes it easier for you, for us to approach you. Yeah, it's, I, 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 generally speaking, I'm a very open person. And I rarely get into low moods. So the smile is natural. It's, it's natural. It comes to me naturally. We like it. <laughs> Okay, so quickly, let's uh, begin with uh, uh, your legacy I mean, in the foreign service. For 34 years, you worked in the diplomatic circles. Yes. And the highlight of your career was when President Ejikum Kufo appointed you as the secretary. Um, kindly let us know what really attracted you into the foreign service. As a young student leader, uh, in 72, I was elected president of the Students' Representative Council in Legon. Okay. And as part of the functions of the SRC president, you traveled to represent students of Ghana at international conferences. And because I spoke French, okay. at a lot of these conferences, I became the uh, go between, between the Francophone and the Anglophone student leaders. And I liked the skills that I was acquiring and learning how to draft resolutions and negotiating uh, positions. And you know, in those days, there were key, big, big issues that we, we, we stood for, like the anti-apartheid struggle. Okay. So South by the Africa. time I had finished, I thought I liked uh, what I was doing. And I looked at diplomacy as a continuation of that journey. Wow. So I took a decision very quickly. Very quickly. But then you also had the opportunity to work with the Zai Embassy in Accra yes, as a volunteer. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm sure I did that my also service in Ho Adola Girls. And when I finished, whilst I was waiting to join the Foreign Service, the then Zai, now DRC, DRC. Embassy, Ambassador, Zekele Chodi, I think that was his name, wanted uh, an interpreter. Okay. And I told him, look, I had no, I was no training as an interpreter, but you can speak did, I did an interview and he liked my work. So for three months, I was in that mission. And during one of those days when I was working for the ambassador, there was a crisis in the east of Ben Zari, now DRC. And GBC came to cover the, <laughs> the, the interview. Event. <laughs> now, two of those who came, the journalist, one was called Steve Tete. Okay. The other was called Gabriel Tocha. Apparently, they were interpreters. So when I finished doing the interpretation, they told me that I was an interpreter. <laughs> and I said, look, I have no training. They said, no, you can do it. You can do it. So that led me into interpretation. Ah. And one of them gave me my first job as a uh, simultaneous interpreter, uh, uh, Tocha. Hmm. And the first one went well. Hmm. So I pretended to be a simultaneous interpreter. <laughs> interpreter. For, and that led me to be interpreter to a number of heads of states. Okay, we'll, we'll get there. So your, your, your ability to speak French, where did you learn it from? I studied what? French. Okay, My secondary first degree level. Was a secondary university. My first degree was a BA honors French. Okay. You know, in our time, we had a system which allowed you as a liberal arts student to study three different subjects. And there was an honest system. So whatever you got an honest in, then became 
your single subject uh, that you opted for for your degree. Yeah. I got three honors, and I preferred to do the uh, <laughs> French. French. And wow. I, I don't regret it at all. You regret it. That's interesting to know. So in 1976, yes, you joined the foreign service. Yes, but then you had, I mean, that option to. Uh, either work for the research department yes. or the mainstream yes. um, service yes. and you opted for the mainstream foreign service what kind of decisions or thinkings went into that decision uh, I, I must admit it was an advice of two former bosses of mine who had first worked in the research department okay. and had then transferred to the main ministry who happened to be on the panel of people interviewing us for the main ministry job, Ambassador Victor Behu and Ambassador Cleland. Mm. And they both called me after the interview and advised me that they'd done research and they'd done the main ministry and they were advising me to mm. go to the main ministry. So really they, they guided me to join the, to go to the main ministry. That, that's good to know. So as a foreign ministry officer, you had the opportunity to work under a number of, I mean, Ghanaian leaders, president from um, President Rawlings as a military leader all the way to President Kufu. Quickly, let's look at the various transitions, the heads of state. We'll look at President Kufu separately, but for President Rawlings, Chairman Rawlings as a military leader uh, through uh, Dr. Liman, who was also a foreign service officer, and then uh, uh, President Rawlings again as a democratic government, uh, government or president. So quickly, let's look at these um, heads of state and your singular contributions or relationships to their governance. The two things. Most heads of states, when they travel around Africa, would have the director of the African Bureau in the Foreign Ministry on board the presidential jet. Okay. And they will also sometimes have the schedule officer for the country. Mm. Now, on very early in the days, when I came back from Paris uh, after studying in France, this was in '79. I'd come back from Paris, and there was a transition, and he would then take me along as his deputy to brief both President Rawlings and president, the incoming president. Mm. Very quickly, President Lehman took to me. Yeah. And since I also happened to be in the African Bureau, he, uh, he directed that I'd be, I'd be asked to join all his trips that he was going to make to Africa. So very quickly, I was fortunately uh, asked <laughs> to join the presidential trips. Wow. And I traveled with him all over Africa. And how old were you at the time? 29. 29? Yes. Wow. Yes, it was the beginning of my career because even though we joined in 76, we were sent to the university for postgraduate studies immediately. And when we came back from Legon after postgraduate studies, I was sent to Paris for further postgraduate studies. Mm. So it was in, on my return in 79 that I really got to work. And then I joined uh, uh, President Le Mans trips all over Africa. Very okay. interesting period. What do you remember of the man? President Lehman. He was a very intellectual person. He was very Pan-Africanist in his ideas and took decisions upon long reflection. But at the same time, he was a very relaxed person. Mm -hmm. So even though I was young, he would often, when we traveled, ask me to do his drafts for him. And I remember the late Professor Bene and uh, Professor Diamond used to travel with us. And they would, so they would pass on the talking points or the communiques and, and I would, so I, 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 I learned the craft, some of it quite early. Mm. But he was, he was a great person. He was so relaxed. And because he was a foreign service officer, he allowed me to play my role as a foreign service officer doing all our trips. It was okay. a good learning period for me. For you and Chairman Rawlings? Well, <laughs> I knew President Rawlings from Achimoto School. Okay. He was two years ahead of me. You know, uh, Chairman Rawlings had always been a very interesting person. <laughs> One of his best friends was my elder brother, Albert, who used to work at the World Bank. 
and two very naughty boys. They used to smoke. <laughs> so they used to send me to go to the villages around to go and buy cigarettes for them. So he knew me. And you never tried it? No, 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 no. Okay. It was too risky at Ashmuta School then. So usually when there's a change of government in a country like Ghana, the government would dispatch a delegation to our neighboring countries uh, to explain the changes which have occurred. So I found that on the first delegation going to Togo, uh, Benin, and Cote d'Ivoire, etc., I went as a member of the, that delegation. Okay. So once we came back, President Rollins also decided that he would travel with me. And so I, we worked together for, for long periods. Okay. And each time I came back from posting, he would, uh, I would accompany him on his trips. You see, there were, it was much easier for Rollins, for instance, to have a foreign service officer who would be doing the normal speech writing, brief talking points, etc. But also would be in a position to interpret for him. Okay. Because some of those meetings would be highly confidential. So it was a win-win situation for everybody. Mm. And uh, working with Rollins was a pleasure. Mm. He, he was pleasant to work with. He would, uh, he gave you the latitude and it, once he thought you, you, you were producing Results. quality stuff, mm. he allowed you to work. Okay. But there were occasions when he would ask you to make his speeches for him. Mm. I remember once we went to a stadium in uh, Ouagadougou and then President Sankara gave a very rousing speech at the mm. stadium. Before he ended, <laughs> President Rollins turned to me and said, look, you're not going to interpret any speech. You're going to reply the speech. <laughs> so I got up and uh, pretended I was replying the speech on behalf of President Rollins. Mm -hmm. So we, we got on well. Yeah. And uh, there was mutual respect allowed me to do my work. So as a foreign service officer, you got the opportunity to work in a number of countries, I mean, as permitted by foreign service. Uh, let's look at two key scenarios that you can identify or talk about as your most um, challenging uh, moment as, as an officer? I think my most challenging posts were Conakry and Kinshasa. Okay. Conakry because Conakry had responsibility for Liberia when the Liberian crisis broke out mm. and we had no embassy in Liberia, so we were given concurrent responsibility okay. for Liberia. Then, in the same period, uh, there was a change of government in the Gambia when President Jawara was ousted and uh, Yaya Jami became president. So, we had two fairly unstable countries oh. which we had to deal with, and during that period, President Rollins was chairman of ECOWAS. Okay. So we had to consistently monitor what was going on as he mediated in trying to stabilize both the Gambia and uh, uh, Liberia. They were very difficult periods. Then Kinshasa because we, I reopened our embassy in Kinshasa in 97, soon after the arrival of senior Kabila. Mm. And there was tremendous instability. There were young soldiers who were members of the AFDL, which had accompanied Kabila to Kinshasa. Many of them were under 20. They didn't speak the language of the capital. Okay. Meanwhile, Mobutu's soldiers, many of them had uh, run amok. And they were looking for means of uh, raiding banks to be able to escape. Mm. And so the security situation in Kinshasa was extremely tenuous and very difficult. Nobody knew who was in charge. Hmm. Some of those in charge then were Rwandans and they were disliked by the people of Kinshasa. They didn't even speak Lingala. Hmm. They spoke mostly Swahili. So, okay. And of course, because of this tenuous situation, there were many attempts to overthrow the government of Kabila, which will result in death. So we, those of us operating in those circumstances, had real difficulties working in the So how did you deal with the issue, those challenges? 
at the time? You had no choice mm. but to build up your security. Okay. And I got permission from the ministry to hire special security. Ah. To a security van ahead of me and one behind me when I was going to work. Because I was in Kinshasa alone. <laughs> wow. It was too dangerous for officers to accompany me. Mm. So for the period I was there, in fact, I advised that it didn't make sense for uh, others to join me to because join there were you. too many deaths, mm. too many coup attempts, and uh, the situation hadn't stabilized quite yet. But it was, it was difficult. It was difficult, and uh, um, it clearly indicates that wars are not good. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and you know, in the case of the DRC, mm. the war was particularly complicated because DRC has nine neighbors. Okay. None of them has the resources that are in DRC. So there's a constant desire on the part of their neighboring countries to take advantage of the enormous resources in okay. the DRC. Okay. And some of that takes the form of uh, ethnic. They are really pseudo-ethnic. They are resource, uh, natural resource-based conflicts. Okay. So consistently, and of course because of that, those, that, because of that situation, a number of countries were interested and would send soldiers I remember at the beginning we had soldiers from Angola, soldiers from Zimbabwe, soldiers from Rwanda, and they were all not on the same side. Mm. And of course there was also a lot of upheaval in the east, the, towards the uh, Rwandan border. Okay. And the Mau Mau were operating, and it, there were lots of groups. As mm. you can see, the, the east of DRC has still not completely settled down. Wow. And it was in the midst of this that I had to travel to the East mm -hmm. and report to my government on what was happening in the DRC. So you can imagine. Yeah. Meanwhile, I had the responsibility for Congo Brazzaville, where there was also instability. Mm. And I had uh, responsibility for uh, Kigali, where there was also instability. And in fact, from Kinshasa to Brazzaville, it's only 20 minutes. So sometimes when the fighting was going on in Brazzaville, I could hear the shooting okay. in Kinshasa. It's just 20 minutes away by, mm. by boat. Mm. Mm. So you can imagine the environment in which I had to operate. Mm. And what were the root cause of some of these, although you've, you've mentioned resources, but beyond resources, which other instances accounted for some of these coups in the 70s and 80s? You know, uh, governance. Mobutu had always been, had been in power after they had murdered Lumumba mm. and uh, there was considerable corruption. Corruption. It was a, a huge personality cult and there was the political space was not open enough and poverty was on the increase. So generally speaking the people wanted a change in the DRC. In the DRC. But the change which occurred did not stabilize the situation because they were, you know, DRC is one of the biggest countries in Africa. Infrastructure is not excellent. Mm -hmm. So traveling is very difficult. So governing from Kinshasa mm -hmm. is particularly difficult. And it's so vast for instance that it took me longer to travel from Kinshasa to Lubumbashi okay. than to fly from Kinshasa to Accra. Oh, yes. Wow. That's how big the JRC is. Mm. You know, currently we're having issues with um, um, global governance, right. issue of poverty, corruption, <laughs> indiscipline. You know, do we foresee an uprising like what happened? Although that was, those were cool. We are in a democratic uh, dispensation now. But do you foresee uprisings like that in the future? It's Excellency. a matter that, that worries me quite a bit. You see, there was a period after the fall of the Berlin Wall that the ideology of liberal democracy became the sing song of everybody. Everybody thought that liberal democracy would produce economic development and would reduce poverty, etc., etc. The evidence, I'm not sure, attests to that. Okay. 
for instance, as part of the uh, ideological front banner of liberal democracy, there was an assumption that once you opened up your markets, mm. direct free, direct uh, uh, foreign investments mm. would flow in. Okay. The results or the imagined benefits or dividends of liberal democracy mm. would have stabilized the world. Yes. Unfortunately, in recent times, mm. Arab Spring, Arab Spring, the yes. return of uh, military regimes, the active engagement of citizens who appear to be very dissatisfied mm -hmm. about forms of governance all over the world. Yes. Now, my question is, is hmm. the response liberal democracy? If all over the world, the, uh, the, look at the example in France, mm -hmm. the Gilets Jaunes, mm -hmm. the uh, ability for liberal democracy to deliver to, uh, to the satisfaction of citizens all over the world mm -hmm. is being questioned. It's being questioned. And I think <laughs> we should start thinking about... Uh, but what do you foresee, Excellency, with your experience? What do you think? I don't want can... to pretend that I'm a soothsayer. <laughs> but the rate at which we are going, mm. clearly societies should respond to the changes which have occurred. Okay. Look, globalization has changed governance. ICT has changed governance. Uh, and because of that, citizens are better informed than they were 20 years ago. Yes. And they can see what is happening in every other country. So if they are hungry and other countries are feeding their people better, they will respond. I'm not sure that the concept of liberal democracy in its original form uh. took into account what All globalization, these. ICT, etc., would do mm. to the uh, information levels of citizens. And if that is so, our societies should start uh, thinking about responses to how we are going to create the conditions or the forms of ideological thinking mm. which will bring uh, economic satisfaction to its citizens. To the people. Thank you, Excellency. I have to quickly take my first break. And when I come back, we'll begin with your um, activities under President Kufu. Okay, Gipti. Okay. So, uh, just joined us. You're watching Legends of Our Time on GBC News and Ghana Television on Facebook at Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. We'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll continue with the conversation. Please don't go away. Welcome back. You're still watching Legend of Our Time on GBC News. My name is Gifte AJ, and my guest for today is Ambassador DK Ose. Hello, Excellency. Um, so, quickly, in 2001, uh, former President Kufu appointed you as the secretary. To you, what really did President Kufu identify in you before he made that decision? Is it um, traditionally, over a long period, many heads of states had selected either foreign service officers or very experienced civil servants okay. to be secretary to the president. To the president. In fact, a lot of people might be unaware, mm. but the secretary to the president, President Rawlings, during the eight-year period that he was president, was one uh, ambassador, Jimmy Misa. Okay who happened to be my director in the foreign ministry. Okay. So it is in that vein that President Kufu also looked for an experienced Person. civil servant to run his office. Okay. And usually in the past it had been civil servants of chief director level. And in 2000, I was already A1. So I was A1, due, which means which to means the A1, you know, in the, uh, if you have a degree, and you start the foreign ministry, you start as A5. Okay. And over a period, you take exams, you go from A5 to A4, A3, A2. Then when you get to A1, then you can be made a career okay. ambassador. Okay. So in 2000 October, we were promoted to uh, A1. Okay. And he looked at the list and thought maybe I would not do a bad job after all. <laughs> so how was the information delivered? Who? 
<laughs> you know, I'd come to Accra for my birthday. And then there was a second round of the election. And uh, on, after the second round, I went to say bye-bye to family. Okay. So I went to say bye-bye to President Kufo's wife. Mm. And he walked into the room and I, I congratulated him. Yeah. He just won uh, the election. And we said bye-bye. Okay. So I got back to Copenhagen and... Do you have any clue? None. Okay. None. So when I got back, I got a call from the then chief director, Ambassador Keto, who said the president wanted to see me. I said, oh, but I saw him two, three <laughs> days ago. I didn't. He said, well, he wants to see get you. back to a crowd. So I got back. He met me at the airport. He drove me straight to his office in his house. It was Jake Obechebilamte who took me in. Yeah. And he said, young man, welcome to Ghana. <laughs> I've appointed you secretary president. Go and set your office up. <laughs> that was it. Whoa. It was, it was, <laughs> Kindly tell us about your role as a secretary to the president. You know, the Secretary of the President's responsibilities include information management, okay. time management. And when I say information management, you deal with all the correspondence meant for, for the, the president. president. Both private and official? No. I mean official. Official. Okay. And so you deal with all this correspondents coming to him and then you also write most of the letters on his behalf okay so what you do at that level is to um, look at uh, all the letters which have been written to the president all the emails and some of them telephone calls you will notice from his correspondence but you usually will receive about over 100 letters a day okay. that most of them are not necessarily meant for the attention of the president okay. or could be handled by other uh, people in other responsible positions. Okay. So you make a determination as to Which what will go to the president and make sure that he doesn't have, he's, he's not overburdened. Invariably, uh, it will mean seeking further information from either his, one of his ministers mm. or one of the departments or agencies. And if it's that important, then the president will see it. Once he's seen them, he gives written instructions. So you immediately have to take action, whether it's from the Bank of Ghana, whether it's from the military, wherever it's coming from. Then you write those letters. But then also, you deal with the president's time. But in dealing with his time, you manage all his meetings. Managing his meetings includes preparing the background for the meetings okay. and providing him the kinds of notes that he will require for like, assuming he's meeting the MD of Barclays Bank from London. He has to be briefed as to what it's likely to be discussed, the kind of mm. data he will mm. need. If he's meeting uh, investors in mm. the gold area, you have to prepare a document to give him data, to give him information, etc. Then also, you have responsibility for the president's travels. Okay. Because, well, in my case, I travel with the president everywhere for the eight year period, except one, because I was not in Ghana. Okay. His first visit was two thousand. I hadn't been appointed yet. But after that, I had to travel with him. So you have to make sure that the speeches are ready and uh, go through the discussions with them mm -hmm. and also keep reminding him about his. Uh, issues that he wants to be uh, brought before cabinet mm. because uh, all official meetings if you are not busy you sit in okay. then you take notes then there's follow-up so you make notes and remind him that you know you took decisions that mm. a b c d should happen uh, do i have your permission to write to convey those instructions etc so it's a lot of work it's a lot of and then of course you also are part of cabinet okay and then you are secretary to the National Security Council. So you have to convene National Security meetings <laughs> uh, and so on and so forth. Wow, wow, that, that, that's good to know. And um, what were some of the uh, critical advice that you gave to President Kufuor that actually, you know, um, kind of helped his government? You know, 
as much as possible. President Kufo insisted I should not be involved in the politics of it. So when he traveled internally, I would usually would not travel with him. Okay. So a lot of the work I did had to do with, you know, the economy, okay. you know, uh, social infrastructure, uh, foreign policy because of my background. Mm -hmm. And you could only so much as give advice. Mm. But the final decision, as you know, would always be taken by the president. By the president. But most of the time, I would not give advice to the president in the presence of a third person. Okay. Because, because of where I sat, because of the responsibilities I had, there will be things that I would have seen that the president might not have seen. So, uh, in responding to some requests, because some of those documents did not get to his table, mm -hmm. he would have given a particular kind of response, okay. which might be contradicted to something, and he said so because he didn't know. Okay. So I would go into his office and say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, maybe I should have added this to your talking points, okay. but because of A, B, C, D, mm. you, you, you might want to reconsider your position. Your position. But really the final decision was taken, by, be him. taken by him. So Excellency, from your experience, what are the qualities of a good secretary to a president? Ooh. First of all, you have to be extremely responsible and be extremely discreet okay discreet, discreet. I like the emphasis <laughs> and avoid uh -huh. public engagement okay because any mistakes you make or any pronouncements you make mm. might be attributed to, to the president but there again mm -hmm. because you're signing letters conveying decision of president you need to be very careful in the manner in which your signature appears anywhere. Okay. In other words, if the president has taken a decision which has legal implications, you must seek legal advice before, be before you write the letter. Okay. And, uh, and I was very fortunate because I, there was a lawyer in the vice president's office who used to help me a lot. He's now an MP, Obi Amwa. Okay. So I never took, I mean, signed a letter which are legal implications without seeking legal advice. A secretary president should also be alert because you are on duty all the time, hmm. particularly when you worked with President Kufour. <laughs> he wouldn't let you sleep. <laughs> I mean, there's no time that he would leave the office before 9 p.m. Wow. No day. Wow. Except his out Six of to nine. Yes. Hmm. And usually he will call you at 6 a.m. whilst you're still in bed <laughs> and give you a lot of instructions. Wow. So you leave a notebook by your bedside. As soon as <laughs> his phone, your phone rings, you know it's him. <laughs> and which meant that over the night he had thought of a number of things. Yes. So you take notes quickly and make sure that by the time you see him later in the day, you would have taken action on a number of the instructions he, he would have you. given you. So, I think the Secretary President should be conscious of the heavy responsibility mm. that is being placed on his shoulders mm. and uh, adopt the kind of attitude which will protect the President. The President. And from what you've explained, it means that the role of a President is, is not a cool job, you know. I, I, I wonder why anybody wants to be President of Ghana. <laughs> why? You know, it's an impossible job. Every day is an emergency, and every hour there's an emergency. Because, I mean, you outside the presidency, you don't know. <laughs> but, and if you make one mistake, a country could lose $20 million just because you haven't thought through the problem. Or some people might die because you have not got a proper security briefing. It's, it's an impossible job. It's an impossible job. And... Uh, nobody seems to be satisfied with what you're doing, <laughs> including no, even those you've given appointments. Yes, because many of the people you appoint think they, you, they could have got better jobs. Those you don't appoint <laughs> are angry with you because you didn't give them jobs. Your party and is... Particularly the party people. So, so angry. <laughs> and a lot of that uh, anger 
is thrown at the secretary president because they want to see the president. Mm. And the president is a busy person. A busy person. So you, you are trying to prevent them from seeing the president. And they usually say, look at this stupid idiot. <laughs> When they were campaigning in the ghettos, <laughs> you were sitting somewhere earning four years change. And now? I've come and sat there and speaking sh 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 some complicated English. And you're not giving us access and to the man. And that, that was one of the greatest problems I had. Just wow. managing his time. Wow. But I didn't mind because to be able to do your job well, uh, you, are, you are going to encounter some break of these. a few eggs. If you want to make an omelette, you cannot avoid breaking the egg so okay. but it was it was worthwhile okay. it was very satisfying very rich and i must admit though that the president made my work easy he had absolute confidence in me in you so when i took decisions in his absence it was very rare that he would come and contradict me because he knew that i was i had no other interest but the interest of state yeah. uh, at stake so he had confidence in me and he he allowed me to do my work. Hmm. I can imagine because he actually wrote your forward, your, your book, um, Privileged Conversations, right. Adventures of an African Diplomat. Diplom yes. Yeah, I've read that. So quickly, let's have an idea. Who is the man President Kufu? You see, President Kufu decided very early in his life that he wanted to be president. Okay. So he trained himself for it. I mean, he went to Oxford and he made sure that he, were, uh, he did PP, politics, philosophy and economics. Mm. Then went to study law okay. because he thought that he would need the law and the economics to be able to do his job. And you know, at the time he was in his early 20s, he was appointed as the lawyer mm. for the then International Bank of Ghana in London. That was an easy job, <laughs> earning a lot of money. But he preferred to come to Ghana. Yeah. And so he came to Ghana, fully determined to pursue his political career. Okay. And uh, because he had given such thought to the job, he had thought through a lot of the issues. And even when you thought he was wrong, hmm. what impressed me was that it was not a mere afterthought. Okay. I mean, it, it, these were issues, if you were talking about currency, he probably had a, a policy which you might disagree with, but he would explain, and you can see that he had deeply thought about it. If you were talking about security, mm. he knew exactly what he wanted. In fact, for him, security was the primary responsibility of the president. Okay. And you could see that he had thought, through, so he had had time to, to think that. through, you remember demonetization and yes, all that. Yes, of the Ghana CD. Like he had thought through this long before. Okay. And he had foreign policy, good neighborliness. Mm -hmm. He had decided, you remember how he was insulted when his first visit was paid to Togo? Mm -hmm. But he, he, it was a decision he had made long before he became president. Because ah. he thought that it wasn't Ghana's business to interfere in the internal affairs of his neighbors. Mm. And that it was in Ghana's interest hmm. to have excellent relations with your neighbors okay. if you wanted to protect your own security. Your own security. So you just, you know, uh, as the French say, le chien à bois, la caravan passe. In mm. other words, when, when a train is going through and the dog is making woo woo woo, -woo <laughs> the, the train doesn't hear the bucket <laughs> of the dog. It, it continues to stay focused. Yeah. Okay, so um, quickly, there's this comment I've come across, I want to pick your mind on that. Um, I've heard people uh, allude to the fact that um, the constitution has given the president or the executive so much power. Do you, do you, what, what's your point on that, Excellency? I think you should place it in context. Mm. And what gave birth to the 1992 constitution. Okay. Clearly, uh, the framers had in mind the kind of military uh, establishment we've had and the kind of president we've had. So too much power uh -huh. was given to the executive. And there are many, many, many articles in our constitution which really shouldn't be there. For because, example? For example, uh, why do we ask the president to appoint half of his ministers from parliament? parliament? 
that automatically makes a lot of MPs, you know, potential uh, ministers. Yeah, want to, you know, cut out the president. They they cannot and parliament is supposed to hold the executive in check. Yes. But many MPs want to be MPs because they want to be ministers. And if you want to be a minister, you don't want to go and criticize your president. <laughs> there are many, 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 many. So we I have mean, to really look at that particular. Oh, we have to. I mean, kill. the president makes at least 5,000 appointments. So people are beholden to him. And then that could lead to sycophancy, mm. and nobody's willing to tell the president that you could be wrong, etc., etc. There are many, 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 many uh, reasons why we need changes in our, in our constitution. But how that is going to happen, I don't you know. Don't, you think the you, time is now? Or? You know, I know of two uh, programs which are ongoing. There's a compact program which is led by ASET. ASET is led by Dr. K.Y. Mwako, okay. which is looking at all facets of our governance. And I am I'm, I'm made to understand that sometime soon, They'll be making recommendations, no, not only about the constitution, but about the election of DC, it's about the, the economy, okay. and what kind of uh, basics we should all agree to, to make mm. sure that we don't have all these uh, upheavals and tablets that we are witnessing now. So mm. I do, I, there are many articles in the constitution, and you make the power, president too powerful. Okay. And that makes it difficult for you to keep a check on him. I, I, I don't think it's good for the country. Okay. And I think we should do something about it. Thank you, Excellency. Um, let's quickly do a diagnosis of Ghana today. What will be your general comment of our country, Ghana now? I think that uh, Ghana today is a reflection of what I talked said about liberal democracy. The challenges Ghana is facing are being faced in many countries in the world. The our response to what democracy should do mm. for the people mm. is very similar to what has happened in Mali okay. or what has happened in Benin or Burkina. So the responses that I'm asking for, I, I, I was talking about earlier have to be a rethink mm. of what we want democracy mm. to produce to our citizens. Okay. And to understand that the modes of governance have to respond to the changes which have emerged in the world. I mean, all facets of your governance, including uh, issues about industrialization, issues Job about security. security job creation have to be novel they have to be they, they, the ones we adopted 20 30 years ago don't seem to be working we have large teaming youths who are unemployed who are in the streets and it's not good for us but it's these are problems that you find everywhere if you look at what's going on in senegal now mm or what's going on in Gam the Gambia, mm. what's going on in Kenya. Okay. The, there's uh, Ruto's victory. Mm. It's an example of how the masses want to claim uh, control of governance for themselves. Yeah. And so we are, our, our responses should take cognizance of the fact that the world has changed, mm. that communication is producing a new citizen, mm. that responses of our citizens yeah. uh, will require that they benefit from uh, democracy. Until that happens, there could be, and I don't predict it, but there could be some socioeconomic instability which nobody wants. Nobody wants. The issue of NDC MPP, how do we resolve that? Because that's also another big issue facing Ghana today. I think both political parties are struggling to respond to the dictates of the 21st century. Clearly, the way we are carrying on will not resolve our problems. So what should be the new focus, Excellency? There is a need for a dialogue 
for the main political parties to agree on a minimum platform okay. which one can call the Ghana project. I mean, if they agree on long-term economic policy, okay. if we reduce through our constitution the winner-takes-all uh, syndrome hmm. and make people feel that even when they lose an election, okay. they can take a part, okay. they can play a part in the way the country is run. Is run. It will reduce the tensions. And that dialogue should be started by the two parties. Everything because it's not in anybody's interest, interest that the country is so divided and everything becomes political. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Excellency, you had a very scandalous free career. Um, what were the pr personal principles you had to adopt in order to stay off problems or issues? You know, uh, when you take any job, you should ask yourself, what are the conditions? If you want to be a Catholic priest, you should know that you cannot marry. <laughs> so the kind of company you keep should be a guide. Now, the day I decided to be Secretary to the President, I understood the heavy responsibility. Okay. So a lot of things had to change in my life. Like what, Excellency? <laughs> When I was younger, I really enjoyed going to nightclubs. Okay. That was the end of it. Just w one example. <laughs> I, I didn't want to be seen in any environment mm. which you create scandal. Secondly, because of the power, powers conferred on our president in our constitution, mm. I opted not to be involved in anything which had to do with contracts. Okay. So I never sat in any, any committee which would uh, examine a contract. Or, so I wouldn't be close to, to issues of uh, finance. And, mm. and then I also kept uh, good counsel. I, 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 I spent eight very peaceful, lonely oh. years. I mean, you, there are many things you couldn't do. And, so I, and I didn't mind really because it was a unique opportunity to make a contribution to the country which had done so much for me. And I relished it. So I look forward to that. I'm not surprised that there were no scandals because I, I, I went out there to, to protect the president and to do my job as diligently as I, 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 I could. Mm. And the, the truth is that at work, hmm. I'm a completely different person. Okay. I mean, if you want to be at peace with me, in, the, in my area of work, discipline is the... My, Celeste will tell you, <laughs> when she sent me a message this morning, the first thing I said to her, look, make sure you're not late. <laughs> That's me. Hmm. And it's from... How I've your training trained and that. And it's, I I have no difficulty with the way I've become. Okay. Uh, but I mean you're on pension now. Yes, but you know when you're on pension <laughs> you still find yourself being drawn into all kinds you know, I used to teach at the university. Okay. And uh, I stopped teaching when I fell ill. Mm. As a result, once a while I go and teach. Okay. classes for some of okay. my colleague lecturers. But, but more importantly, I'm now president of the Council of Foreign Relations. We'll Canada. come there, but I, I wanted to follow up by asking you, it was worth taking up that challenge or that opportunity that was given to you by President Kufu as the secretary to the president? I'll tell you, I cannot be more grateful than, I cannot express my gratitude to him because the experience that it gave me, the exposure that it gave me, and it gave me a deep understanding of my country. Okay. It also gave me an opportunity, in all modesty, to make a, a humble contribution to the development of the country. Okay. And I must say that in recent times, when I hear people talking about President Kufour's government two terms, mm -hmm. I'm very pleased that even as a poor uh, messenger, <laughs> I might have part. made a, a modest contribution. 
I was. So that's I, I, I would not have chosen anything but that. It was a wonderful experience, and I, I'm very grateful to him for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Excellency. So we'll take our second break. We'll be back shortly. Please stay with us. Hello again. You're still watching Legends of Our Time on GBC News, Ghana Television, and on Facebook at Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. My name is Gifty AJ, and my guest for today is Ambassador DK Ose, an astute diplomat. Excellency, so let's quickly look at your role with the, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations Ghana. That's an ivory tower of past ambassadors. First of all, uh, the council comprises other personalities than former ambassadors. Okay, thank you. It is a platform aimed at getting the population interested in issues of foreign policy. Mm. Because Ghana has a lot of uh, think tanks yeah. for the economy, for mm. democracy, education, for, education yeah. governance. Mm. But we didn't have anything for foreign policy. And a lot of people don't realize how foreign policy impacts their everyday life. Ah. For instance, I mean, uh, the price of bread has gone up. And that has to do with decisions uh, being taken in Ukraine and Russia. Mm. I mean, if OPEC uh, reduces uh, petroleum prices, immediately it, it affects, affects how much money your, mm. your husband can give you for, to go to the market. Okay. Even the, the, the things you buy on the market and, and so on and so forth, even what you eat. Mm. So we first thing is to try and get the population more actively involved. That's why we've been having all these Distinguished Guest Lecture Series. Okay. Then we also are interested in uh, a lot of publications on, in Your the area of international wise. relations. Mm. So we publish uh, 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 a magazine every three months. Okay. Since we were but you have also been encouraging your members to publish write their, their memoirs. That's another leg of our activity. But we, so we've been busy. We've had over close to 30 okay. public engagements with very renowned hmm. personalities, including uh, Nobel Peace Laureate uh, Wole Shoinka. Ah, uh, that's a big one. Oh, we've had oh, okay. We had the president of the UN General Assembly. Okay. We had the Deputy Secretary General of the, of the UN. Hmm. We had the Vice President of the e European Union. Okay. We had the uh, uh, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General in West Africa. Mm -hmm. We've had several <laughs> renowned yes. personalities who have engaged that. Marina Samos was our ah. first speaker. Okay. Yeah, and it's gone down well. Mm. Quickly, let's look at your uh, background, your early days, who right. is Ambassador uh, right. Dike Ose. Yeah. Uh, where do you come from, your parents, siblings, and then... Uh, my, my, my mother is uh, Fanti Brong. Ah. Her father is from Elbina. Okay. And her mother is from Sunyan Dumas. My father well, is What's a combination? Fanti Mono. Brilliant. <laughs> so if I wanted to be a politician, I could be... Even suffer. Uh, oh, I, my father's constituency is uh, Ntonsu area. Okay. Kwabri. So I can be MP in... Uh, Sugani or uh, Takradi or okay. Elmina or uh -huh. Kwabri or anyway. <laughs> that's, that, that's the background. Okay. That's why, you know, uh, Judge Mensah is my uncle. Okay. Was the late Judge Mensah. Mm -hmm. he, 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 he had a choice between Elmina and uh, Sugani. Okay. But eventually he opted for Sugani. For Sugani. Yeah. So we can be MPs anyway. My, my younger brother was MP in uh, Pankrono. Pankrono. That's Do a shanty Do region. Dr. Kutosei. Okay. Yeah. Because my paternal grandfather Hills from Pankron. Okay. We were from all kinds of places. Ah. I went to school in Kumasi. Okay. Saint that Joseph. means you lived in Kumasi. Oh, I did. Okay. Before I came to Achimota School. Okay. I went to primary school in St. Joseph's. Mm. Came to Achimota School. Then Legon. Uh, Legon again. Then uh, Paris. Okay. Further postgraduate foreign service. Foreign service. How many siblings do you have, Excellency? Uh, we were nine. The World Bank Albert died just a few years back. Okay. The first one is a doctor. Okay. He specializes in lung diseases. Okay. The second one, all the girls are teachers. Okay. Were teachers. Any special reasons? My father started off as a teacher before okay. he joined uh, UAC, Unilever. Hmm. 
And the second one is the one who we lost. Third one is a lady who was a teacher. She's retired. I'm mm -hmm. the fourth. Okay. The fifth is uh, the former minister for monitoring and evaluation. He's now economic advisor to the president. Okay. The sixth is a professor in Delaware. Okay. The seventh is a retired teacher. The eighth is a retired teacher. Okay. And the ninth is the vice president of a pharmaceutical company in the U.S. That's fine. So we're a very closely knit family. Okay. And both maternal and paternal sides got very close to us. So we had a very, very peaceful childhood. Tell us about your family now, your wife and children. I have three boys. Okay. They're all married. Mm. My wife just left home. Yeah. Uh, and they do, the boys are doing well. Okay. First one works for the Bank of Ghana. The second one is a lawyer. Uh, he's practicing in a firm in London. Mm. Third one works with, I think, Guinness. Okay. And we're very, they, they come here every weekend. That's come fine. and disturb the old man. <laughs> Excellency, so um, what kind of advice would you share with us, especially the youth, if we want to become useful citizens like you are? Yeah, I think that a lot of the young people of our days are too impatient. And they're, they're looking for uh, gold when they are 19. Okay. There's no easy way to make money. There's only one way to make money, to work hard. Hard work. So whatever you put your mind to, just do it so well, it will be beneficial to you. I think I'm, I'm very worried about the level of impatience that I see from, I can understand them. Because the time that we, we finished university, we had jobs open to us all over the place. So I can understand. But some of the things I see on social media, we should be careful. Okay. Morality, ethics, etc. We should be careful. We should be careful. We, we don't want to destroy our society. Mm. And I will encourage them just to work hard and to be humble and honest. And honest. If they are, there's no way they will not succeed. Mm. And also to, to let them understand that you don't achieve uh, results from cutting corners. I mean, they, they have no idea how hard we've had to work. <laughs> you know, it took me 25 years to go from A5 to A1. Okay. Yeah, through coup d'etats, changes of governments, etc. Many people would have left. Some of our colleagues left because they were, you know, they were impatient. But I had the patience to wait. And also, I tried to work hard mm. and learn from the masters. Okay. So, I hope the young men will take a cue from us, and the young men and women. <laughs> those with a dream to I mean, join the foreign service, what are the do's that they should go by in order to succeed Very with that passion? In the foreign service, you have to know enough about a lot of things. Okay. So if you're interested in being a foreign service, you should read, 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 and never stop reading. Okay. Because situations change every morning mm. and particularly now so if you want to be a successful foreign service officer you take to. your training seriously okay. but never stop reading never stop reading excellency my last question yes how do you want to be remembered i want to be remembered as a humble messenger of the state Thank you so much, so Excellency, for your time. Indeed, we Thank are so grateful. Much, <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. The program has been Legends of Our Time on GBC News, Ghana Television, and on Facebook at Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. My guest for today has been an astute diplomat, Ambassador D.K. Osei. My name is Gifty E.J. Thank you so much for watching. We'll come your way same time, God willing, next week. Until then, bye for now.